just a warning. Exodus chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 12 if you want to make your way there. And I would like to pray again. Bow your heads with me. Father, we're so grateful for the power, the strength, the trustworthiness of your word. It is the living word. We believe that as we come to the scriptures, that we can trust it to speak truth into our lives. Holy Spirit, Please speak this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would help me to step aside, that you would speak. That you would clear our minds and our our hearts, Lord, of, of things that would be distracting to us right now. There's so much going on in the world today that could cause us to fear, cause us to be concerned and worried and we could bring those things in here and cause us not to hear from you in our own lives we have worries and concerns and struggles i pray lord that for for this next few minutes as we study your word that you could help us to just set those aside set those in front of you help us to hear from you your word is alive i pray that you would use it to minister to us individually and corporately the way that only you can do we did not come here to to listen to to adam speak i do not have the words lord you have the words so please speak to us we pray these things in jesus name amen Chapter 12, starting in verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. How do we get here? Remember one of the things that we've talked about is that this this whole journey this whole picture of exodus could be viewed in one of the ways we viewed it it can be viewed as a as a type or as a picture of of what it looks like to be or or being saved and we've watched the journey and the different types and moses the the picture of of being saved and how god has called him and wooed him and taught him and And it took 80 years, you know, for Moses to really get on the road. And Moses responding to the light that was given. And finally getting on to the road of of really responding to the light where God was giving him further and further instructions. And Moses getting more and more obedient to those instructions. But, But Pharaoh, was Pharaoh given light? Was Pharaoh given opportunity? Absolutely. The signs and wonders, were were those not light? Was that not opportunity? It definitely was. Was Pharaoh responding? No, Pharaoh was hardening his heart and resisting the Lord and rebelling against it. And so were all of the people. I mean, at least most of the people. Right, we'll read in a minute, a mixed multitude went out with Egypt. Not just Israelites. There were Egyptians. There were others that did respond to the light. Right? But Pharaoh and his servants and most of Egypt did not. 
And so we've seen this, this parallel, this, this pattern, but we see this, this picture of what it's like to be being saved. And that's what it was for us. You would not be saved if God had not reached out, reached down with an outstretched arm and reached out to you and sought to win you, sought to woo you, sought to convince you, sought to bring you to His Son, giving you light, giving you knowledge, bringing you closer and closer to the knowledge. And we come to this point, chapter, tw- or chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, where judgment is coming to the land of Egypt. Judgment is coming. And that is the message of the Gospel. That's where the message of the Gospel has to start. And at verse 12 here, 12 and 13, we get to, really, if you want to see it this way, a true presentation of the Gospel. And a true presentation of the Gospel has to sort of begin with what? The bad news. If you don't tell somebody the bad news first, the good news doesn't really sound so good. It's kind of like a doctor who walks in and says, I got great news. I got a cure. Take these, go home, you're going to be fine. But he never told you that you're sick. He never told you what was wrong with you. You're going to be like, um, no, I'm not going to do that. If, if you weren't first told what was wrong, you wouldn't be too quick to take the medicine, right? Am I the only one in the room that wouldn't just go home and take the medicine if I didn't know what I'm treating? I'm not, right? None of you would do that. And if you are, please meet me after the service because you shouldn't. Okay? That's really a bad idea. Seriously. Don't be that person. Don't do that. You wouldn't. And sometimes that's what happens with the gospel today. And, and that's the, 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 the gospel that is presented. It's, it's a false gospel. It's presented with the idea that you add Jesus to your life to make your current life better. Right? Put on Jesus and it'll make your current life better. Or add Jesus to your current life and it'll make your current life better. Christian, did that happen for you? I mean, sure, he's cleaned up your life and you should now be living the abundant life. But did life continue to pound you? Probably and maybe even worse right? But now you have peace and joy and love and hope that has actually made life better, but that's not why you received Christ. You received Christ because of the bad news, which is the reality of judgment that is definitely coming to everyone in Egypt. It's a sure thing. Now, if you were just to pick up your Bible, open up chapter 12, open up verse 12 and read this. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on this night, and I will strike all the firstborn, and the firstborn of every house is going to die. You might go, wow, that is one mean God. He's just going to go through Egypt and strike the firstborn? of What is up with that? Well, wait a second. For 400 years, these Egyptians have been brutally abusing the Israelites. Did you forget that part? Did you forget that they were throwing all the male children of the Israelites into the river? Did you forget that they've enslaved them and were cruel to them and have been literally using and abusing them for 400 years? And God has been withholding judgment against them? And did you forget the fact that for however long these plagues have been happening, God was seeking to bring them to repentance, but they would not? Did we forget all of that? 
before we got to this point? Did you also forget that this whole thing opened up with God telling them that if you would not repent, all of your firstborn would die? That was actually the first thing that God warned them of? See, we always, we're, we're like that. Even in our own flesh, we can come to God and sometimes go, aren't you a little harsh? Aren't you a little quick to, isn't that a little heavy-handed? When actually, we're way more harsh. We're way more heavy-handed than God is. He, his patience and long-suffering and mercy is so much greater than ours. So much greater than ours. Case in point, everyone in these houses deserve to die. And he only takes the firstborn. That's mercy. That sounds hard, right? You're like, really? Like, that's how many hundreds of thousands potentially? No, this is mercy. This is mercy. Especially when you consider this. All it would take was, was to follow the instructions of taking the lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost. And the angel of death would pass over. This is the gospel. You see, our friends and families and neighbors, everyone we know, every single person that you have ever met, known, or loved has sinned against God, including you and I. I deserve death, hell, and damnation. Sure, judgment was against me, and I deserve it because I have offended a holy God. Because I have hated and I have lusted and I have stolen and I have lied and I have literally broken every single one of His commandments. And the punishment for sin is death. And it is a righteous judgment for God to judge me. But he loves, and he is merciful, and he is gracious. And so he sent his son, the true Lamb of God, and he spilt his blood. And if I will follow the instructions, and I will apply the blood, then the angel of death will pass over. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. It's right here. Sure, judgment is coming. But when he sees the blood, it's not my works. It's not anything but the blood that causes him to pass over. And when I, chapter, verse 13, and when I what? See the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you. Verse 14. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast. So this, remember, this is a picture of what is being saved. So here, we've delivered the gospel. Well, we, well let's go back. We've responded to this light. We were in the world, and, and God is. God has given us this light and we've responded to it and, and we've moved by faith and now we've been delivered this, this news of sure judgment. This night, judgment is coming. But if you apply the blood, if you apply it, then the, the angel of death will pass over. And now we read, so this day shall be a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generation. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. And he goes on to explain, this is, this is actually an explanation of what they're going to do after they get out. Like this is, this is the memorial, but it speaks to us in this context that I'm speaking of. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. What is leaven a picture of in the scriptures? Sin. Why is leaven a picture of sin? Leaven is yeast, right? Yeast is a bacteria, 
essentially, right? And, and what happens when you take yeast, and you take a little bit of yeast if you do it right? We seem to have a real problem with doing this in our house. Now, I don't know if you're really good at baking. I'm, let me say we. I'm going to pick on my wife because I've never actually tried to do this, so maybe I'm worse than her, maybe I'm not. But we tend to, we, I'm because she's my other half, right? So I'm just grouping us together. Okay, you get it? In my house, we do not usually, we're not usually successful in baking bread. I'm just going to say that. But, but sometimes we are. But you're supposed to take yeast and you put it into a little lump and then what does it do? It rises. And what happens is this. That little bit of yeast technically infects. Right? That's what it's doing. It's like an infection. It infects the whole lump. It causes a chain reaction and it spreads. And, and that's what it's doing so that that bacteria grows and it, it infects the whole, that's what it's doing. It's a chain reaction. It's feeding on and it, it you're, ew. that's what it does. And as it feeds, it lets off a gas, right? And it makes it rise. That's what's happening. It's biology. It's farting, you know, and, and it's making it blow up. That's what it's doing. You know, it's eating and it's farting, I think. That's the way I see it. You may not see it that way, but that's what I think is happening. Anyways, so it's, it's doing that whole chain reaction thing, right? And it just takes a little bit of leaven to what? Jesus said it. Leaven the whole lump. And that's what sin does. A little bit of sin in your life, what? Leavens the whole lump. And so that's the picture. And so here, here, this is the picture of sin. So seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So get the sin out, right? On the first day you shall remove leaven from your house. Now this is, this is an ordinance. What he's, what he's talking about here is when you've, you've actually left, when you've left, you're going to do this in the future. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread bread. It's, it's, a whole, it's a whole thing. We're not going to go into this. We'll talk about this later. I'm now just talking about this as a, I'm, I'm going to use this as an analogy for us this morning, right? On the first day you shall remove leaven from your house. For whoever eats unleavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, so this is a seven day deal, that person shall be cut off from Israel. In other words, doing this thing is a really big deal. God's saying, you must follow this. You understand what it means to be cut off from Israel? Ostracized, kicked out, not allowed to participate. Big deal. On the first day, verse 16, uh, and this would be the seventh day of the month. On the first day, there should be a holy convocation. So this would be the uh, Sabbath day. On the seventh day, should, there shall be a holy convocation. That would be another Sabbath day. No manner of work shall be done on them. Very important. Pay attention to that. But that which everyone must eat, that only may you prepare. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. So they're going to start this whole feast seven days before the Sabbath. right? So seven days before the Sabbath, they're going to get all the leaven out of their house, and from that day on, they're going to eat only unleavened bread, the little wafer cracker things, right? Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations and everlasting ordinance. Are they still doing this today? Absolutely. Absolutely they're still doing this today. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month of evening. How much would you look forward to like a biscuit or a loaf of bread at the end of this? Oh my. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your house, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. What is this a picture of? What, for us, what is this a picture of? If we're looking at this whole thing as a picture of being saved. 
repentance. It's a picture of repentance. Do you, is, is repentance required, guys, for salvation? That's a big debate today. That's a big debate today. Yet, do you believe that? Do you believe that that's a big debate today? I couldn't believe it when I was talking to a pastor. And they literally said to me, well, they don't, have, they don't have to repent to be saved. And I almost doubled over like, what? Are we really there? We're there. We're at the point where we're debating whether repentance is part of the salvation, part of the gospel. So you don't preach, you don't teach that repentance is part of the gospel message. You, you don't do that. They're like, no, repentance is for the Christian. I go, agreed, agreed. But it's also part of the gospel message. And they're like, no. Really, we're there? No, it's not? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Non-negotiable. Now, it looks different. It looks different. What do I mean? Repentance before salvation is not clean up and completely stop sinning. Okay? If that was the case, none of you would be saved. Right? Because none of us have yet to stop sinning completely. Right? And that, that is not going to happen until you get your new bodies. So if that's what we mean, then, then no. But that's not what we mean. But, but there is true repentance. And when you read this, they're supposed to get all of the leaven out of the house. This is a clean the house. Clean it thoroughly. What is that talking about? True repentance. True repentance. What is true repentance? A sorrow for my sin, a recognition that is, is really sin, a turning from that and a turning to the Lord. I, I believe that the true faith, true belief, and repentance are just two sides of the same coin. They're just two sides of the same coin. They, they, they happen at the same time. It's, it's really the same movement, if you will. You repent of unbelief and of love of sin to belief and, and, and a desire to follow the Lord. That's what it looks like. It happens at the same time. And it is a work of the Lord, it is, but it is also something that you do. You, but it's, it's not a work. It's not a work, because twice here it says, you shall do no work. That's why I pointed that out. You shall do no work. It's written right into this. It's a picture of both. It's not a work. There's no work involved. To believe in the Lord and to repent, it's a turning. It's, no, I don't want sin anymore. That's ugly and damaging. It's sending me to hell. I agree with you, God, that that's what that is. That's what repentance is. I agree. That's sin. I don't want that. You're right. That's what that is. I want forgiveness. I want life. I want Jesus. I want what you have for me. And if you disagree with me on that, I'm sorry you're wrong. Because that's what the Bible teaches. You're just wrong. That's not the gospel. The gospel teaches that. That's a must. That's a non-negotiable. That's the gospel. And make sure that you bring that with your gospel. Because if you don't, it's not the gospel. It's a false gospel. But also make sure this, that you don't add to that. That, it, that, that, that it's not more than that. That it's not, you have to somehow clean up something because we also have a tendency to add to that. That somehow that person has to change something else. No, 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 no. If you do that, you add to it. And that is equally as dangerous as removing that. Neither one is right and both are dangerous. So be very, very careful to only bring what God has. Amen? You understand? It's very important. But both are right. And both are necessary. Repentance is required, but not perfection, uh, sinlessness. If we are working on an unbeliever to remove sin from their lives, their daily lives, if that's what we're doing, 
We're actually trying to make them a Pharisee. Right? We're trying to make them self-righteous, which is harming them. That's actually harming them. Because we're trying to teach them that they can be righteous apart from Christ. That's not helpful to them. Once I'm saved, well, we'll get to that in a second. Does that all make sense? This is obviously, uh, there's a lot more here, but that's what I wanted, that's what I'm pulling out this morning. So, All right, verse 21. Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said to them, you notice what's really interesting? We still haven't got to the plague. This is the first plague that has like a huge pause between, like he declared it was coming and there's all this preparatory work. I wonder how long this took. You know, it obviously took some days because they had some preparatory, but now we're here. We're at this point. He's actually calling the elders together, and they're going to do it. But this is very interesting. And and believe it or not, I was, uh, the Lord just, as I was reading this morning, I was, like, literally, the, I kind of think the Lord was speaking to me about this just this morning. Then Moses, what did God say to Moses? You shall be like God to the people, and Aaron shall be like your prophet. Well, actually, God to to. Pharaoh and Aaron shall be like your prophet. Remember when he told Moses this? He says, Then Moses uh, called for the elders and said to them, Pick out the lamb for yourself according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. It's almost like we see the picture of God telling the people to receive Christ here. We see the gospel was given, right? Right? The gospel is given, the call for repentance, right here, and now the application of the blood. Isn't that interesting? You see how, you see the, the, the movement of the gospel here? The gospel was proclaimed, the bad news, then here's the gospel, you got to do this. Now the call for repentance, and now here he says, he calls them all and he says, you got to apply it. Moses tells them. So, so the Holy Spirit will tell us, you've got to apply the blood. You've got to do this. I just thought that was interesting. And you shall take a, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel on the do, two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And here's the thing. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. I love that um, story in Acts. And I don't know where it is, so I'm not going to go try to find it. I'll just (laughs) ad-lib. Do you remember the story when Paul was on on the ship heading to Rome? And they were heading into the big storm. And uh, the guys were getting pretty freaked out. And Jesus met Paul, like literally met Paul on the ship. And he told them, nobody's going to lose their lives if everybody just stays on the ship. they got, they got to stay on the boat. Do you remember that story? And they were throwing everything out. And they were just about to let down the boats, the little dinghies. And start getting off the boat. And he says, no, 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 no. Cut those boats out. Stay on the ship. You'll stay alive if you stay on the ship. I always see that as a picture of of you. You will be in the midst of a storm. You could be in the midst of craziness. But you stay alive if you stay in the ship. Death was coming to Egypt. Death was coming. There was only one safe place. Only one safe place. And that safe place was where the blood was. Where the blood was. There's no other safe place. Jesus in the garden, the night that he was going to be crucified. John 15. What did he say to the guys? He said, abide in me. And my word abide in you and you will bear fruit. That word abide is to remain or stay or live. 
We need to remain, stay in Jesus. Now, I don't believe that you can lose your salvation. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I believe that if you are truly saved, you will stay. You will remain. But I believe that I will remain because I'm truly saved. Do you understand? I know I'm going to truly stay because I am saved. And that is why I'm going to remain. But I'm also commanded to remain. And so that's why I'm going to remain because I'm truly saved but I'm told to remain, so I must remain. It's a command for me, but I have a choice, and I'm going to do it because I'm truly saved, but I have a choice. It's like nosebleed. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I could keep going in a circle, and I could just keep talking until you say, shut up! There, there, it's, that, it's that wrestle of like, I do have free will. I do. I really do. I actually really do. But I've been born again. There was a true, like eternal, real, actual transformation that took place in me. It really happened. When I trusted Christ, I've never been the same since. I can't go back. I can't be something, I'm I'm never going to be that again. I'm something different. But the Bible continually tells me to make the choice to follow Christ. And I have to make a choice each day to follow Christ. But you know what? I'm going to follow Christ because I was transformed back then when I actually trusted Christ. Now some days... I'm not going to follow him as well as other days because there's a real battle going on in me with my real flesh, this hunk of meat that I'm walking around in that is actually riddled with the sin curse. It's true. It's not some kind of weird thing. This thing is cursed, and I'm battling it, and so are you. If you've been born again, you're battling this hunk of meat. One day you're going to be free of it. You're not supposed to beat on this thing. Just let it die naturally. Right? It'll happen. Or maybe you'll get hit by a bus, but don't jump in front of one. Right? Don't tempt God. Right? You know? But you're going to have a new body, and it's not going to have that sin nature. And you're not going to battle that anymore. It's going to be gone. You're going to be free of it. Praise the Lord, right? Right? That day is actually coming. That was a rabbit trail that lost me. Anybody remember where I was? What verse? Okay. We'll pick up at 23. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, The Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. God is absolutely the one who is exacting this judgment, but it seems that the one who is doing the destroying is the destroyer, which I would assume, and I am making an assumption here, is some kind of angel of death, right? I mean, it's, that's what I'm assuming, and You could make your own judgment calls on that. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons uh, forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land uh, which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So they worshipped and bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. So they did this. Verse 29 and 30. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. 
from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Man. That's a crazy verse. Judgment is coming. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, remember, we had read earlier, his servants are speaking for him. He called them and through his servants he sent his servants. Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. The fear of the Lord had obviously and completely fallen on the people. You know, what should have been a blessing had become a fear to them. And that is what happens. When you rebel, when you con- continually rebel against the Lord, what should be a blessing becomes a cursing. The light that should be a blessing to you, you run from it and you become afraid of it. Have you noticed that with some people? The, the, the same people go, oh, if I went into a church, I'd just, I'd just burst into flames. You know some of those people? What should be a blessing to them, they're afraid of. And and that's where these people are at. They say, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And I see a picture here. If you want to go and read Ephesians, it's not a perfect picture. But all the blessings in the heavenlies, the Bible says, are ours in Jesus. These people have, have come They have repented, they have believed in the name of the Lord, they by faith applied the blood, the destroyer has passed over. They are now leaving Egypt, and what are they leaving with? The blessing, the favor of the Lord, the riches of the Lord. Christian, when you trusted Christ, when the blood was applied, you didn't leave empty-handed. You didn't come into the kingdom empty-handed. But all the riches of heaven were given to you. you. You went out full. You went out with everything. And they went out with everything. They plundered Egypt. This is, I'm not talking about material wealth. They obviously left materially wealthy. And if anyone wants to make that case, that is a false teaching. That is a false teaching. All of these things are pointing far more to spiritual truths than to make some kind of case where, hey, if if you're a Christian, you should be wealthy. No, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. That's not the case that's being made. And even the case I'm making is shaky at best, but it's kind of a neat picture, potentially. Then it says, um, then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sekoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. Uh, estimates of 2,000 Israelites, le- or pardon me, 2 million Israelites leaving Egypt in this trip. Verse 38, a mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds a great deal of livestock. Not just Israelites, but Egyptians. And possibly other sojourners, right? I mean, Egypt was a huge city, a huge land. 
There could have been others. And I love this, this picture in verse 39. They're now out of Egypt, or they're leaving Egypt. And look at this. Here's the first time we see this. And they baked unleavened cakes. Again, the picture of being saved. This is the first time we see them baking the unleavened cakes. Here's the works of the the sinless works or the works of righteousness. See, post, post salvation, there's a works of righteousness. They're doing works of righteousness here. Again, it's a, it's a shaky picture. It's maybe a little bit light, but I kind of saw it. And aren't we to do works of righteousness after salvation, after we come out? They're baking cakes of unleavened bread. Christian, when we are coming to Christ, there's no works. Our repentance, if this is also the same picture of repentance, there is a working Uh, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. They're baking the unleavened bread. If we see it in the same light, post-salvation. Let me say this. As a Christian, you are to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. When you're uh, uh, talking to an unbeliever, repentance is turning from your sin. I don't want sin anymore. I want Christ. But as a Christian, you are to forsake sin. Turn away from sin. If there is sin in your life, the Lord wants you to lay that sin at His feet and no longer walk in it. There is no room for it in your life. And there is no excuse for it. I will not give you a sin pass as a Christian. Yep, you can just continue to sin. That's fine. And the scriptures do not give us that. But that's speaking to Christians. That's talking to us believers. That, that's, a, that's a family conversation, right? Us who are in the Lord. Us who have trusted Christ. Those that have been born again. Here we see them baking unleavened bread. I love that picture. It's, it's, it's post-salvation. It's post-Passover. Uh, And then here it also says, I love this. Um, So they brought out of Egypt, uh, verse 39, for it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait. And then check this out. Nor had they prepared provision for themselves, guys. But we don't take anything else with us. See, we are still not working for our salvation. You're to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What is that? I'm supposed to kick sin out of my life, but I'm not working for my salvation. They didn't bring other, any other provision. How do I do that? I trust the Lord for it. It's by faith. You don't see them hauling their stoves behind them and, and bringing all the stuff. No, no. What do they have? They have a bowl on their back. I mean, they don't got nothing. You don't take anything on this journey. You're believing the Lord for it. I told you. Remember I told you like when we started chapter 12? I'd never be able to touch it all. I mean, we're just like scratching the surface. And since I am going to finish this chapter, I'm going to read most of it and we're going we're to close up. By the way, it's only 12 o'clock. So those of you who are getting upset with me on the time, there's just a potluck and you're hungry, but I'm going to finish it. And since I got the mic, I'm just kidding. You're like, we got the door. We can walk out. All right, where was I? Now the, so, <laughs> now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years, just as the Lord had said. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, on that very same day, on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land. That's the second time he's called them an army. It is a night of solemn observ- uh, observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generation. 
And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is brought for money, bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant uh, shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be a, as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Thus all the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children, out, uh, uh, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. The third time here in chapter 12 that he calls these people armies. Let me ask you a question. Do you think if you saw this group of people walking out of Israel, pardon me, out of Egypt, that you would have said, wow, look at that army. I'm just, do you think so? If you had a bird's nest view and you're like, look at that, look at that army. Is that what you would have called them? No way. There is, okay, think about the picture. What do they got tied to their backs? Bulls. Bulls. They got bulls tied to their back. What do you think they're wearing? Rags. Maybe they've got a sack of gold. Okay, because they plundered the Egyptians, right? Maybe they've got sandals. That, you know, they got sandals on. Maybe they've got some farming tools or some shepherd staffs. Okay? Would you call these people an army? No. The answer is no. If you saw this group leaving Egypt, you wouldn't be like, wow, look at that army. Wow, that's an army. You wouldn't. But three times in the last area of this chapter, God, God calls them His army. He goes, yeah, there's my army. Yeah, that's my army. Kind of puts into perspective what God sees and what we see. You know what I think? I think when God looks at this church, I think he sees an army. Would you see an army? When you look at this church, would you see an army? You know, I really felt at the beginning of last week the enemy's heavy-handed attack. I really felt it. And I think a lot of you did too. There was all kinds of, I mean, a lot of them were little, but they stacked up. Stupid things, you know? I mean, because that's who he is, right? And someone came up here today and said that they heard from a lot of people that that was the best VBS that this church has ever put on. And I have to agree with them. And I'm positive that the gospel of Jesus Christ was proclaimed at least four times last week to 30 to 40 children. And although some people might go, oh, just children, I'm actually really positive that that pleased the Lord greatly. And although some may be naysayers to that, I know my Lord was pleased by that. And I know that the enemy was greatly displeased by that. So you know what I see when I look out here? I see an army. I see an army. And I want you to understand that the Lord sees an army. 
He doesn't need for you to be anything more than who you are right now. For Him to use you, for Him to do mighty works through you, for Him to bless you, for Him to raise you up, for this church to do great things in this community. We don't have to wait for something. You know, I, I want us to stop waiting for something. We're not waiting for anything. He has given us everything we need today. He has given us His Holy Spirit. We are washed and cleansed by His blood. Jesus is with us. And I think He proved to us last week that He can use us. We are a mighty army of the Lord. I promise you, if you saw this group leaving all you would say is there's a whole bunch of slaves leaving Egypt. You wouldn't have saw it. They were beat down. They were tired. And God said three times, that's my army. That's my army. And that's what he says when he sees us. I'm sure of it. I'm positive. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father. 